Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Much has been written about the struggles and strivings, the successes and setbacks of working class blacks and of the black underclass. Much less has been written about blacks who live at the upper echelon of American black society, with trappings that not many whites enjoy. In her latest book, Negro Land, a memoir, Margot Jefferson, the Pulitzer Prize winning book and theater critic, writes about that world, which she grew up in. And for those who have little or no awareness of that world, she offers a look into a culture of privileged blacks for whom appearances are paramount and who feel a special obligation to be uplifters of their race. Welcome. Thank you. So, what motivated you to write this book? Hmm. Well, very personally, my parents' generation, um, all of whom were born in the early, really first decades of the, of the 20th century, they were dying off. And I'd become increasingly aware that you know, an entire world of rituals, beliefs, ha habits, manners, um, was going with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to record it and, and also to examine Okay. It. You know, the book is, uh, it's an homage, but it's also a critique in, in real ways. Um, you know, um, a, kind of, a kind of elegy for that. And I wanted to document how my generation, the uh, post-war generation, how someone in my generation navigated um, what were really significant changes, right. civil rights, black power, women's movement, um, you know, and how one moved what began as essentially a segregated world, moved as I moved into white schools, into two semi-segregated to semi-integrated worlds, just these navigations constantly. Uh, they go on within what appears to be because, you know, of economics, of social you know, manners, it appears to be a normal, you know, bourgeois world. Um, it, it's charged with tension, right. and, you know, right. um, caste and class issues, and I wanted to record that. Okay. Why the title Negro Land? Again, very much to do, well, to do with two things. One, I thought it would be a kind of short, shortcut symbol um, for a very particular period. Negro became, it was capitalized in 1947, but, you know, Negro was the honorable word right. for, for our people, for us, for a certain period of time. And it happens to cover the period I'm writing about with that rupture in the 60s where we moved to, and I absolutely embrace that at the right. time we moved to black, and then after that to African American. So I, I wanted to get at that. But also, you know, the word was so full of meanings and resonances, you know, um, oh, the Negro leaders today. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it's just, as I think I say, it's like a tonal language word. Right, it means right. five or six things. And I wanted to convey that. And I think about Skip Gates's memoir, which is about color people. Back when we were, exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. So it, right. didn't it begin with, you know, the colored and then, then Negro with a brief, brief period for Afro-American. Right. And then back to Negro and then black and now African American. Right. So, right. Yeah, we were all of those things. Yes. And we were in a in a land, a particular space between much of the black world and much of the white world. So I wanted land to okay. convey that too. Now, your father was uh, a pediatrician. Right. And, and a large part of the book is about your life in Chicago with an older sister, father who was a pediatrician, a mother who was a social worker who stopped working, you know, once she got married to become a, to raise her children and be a homemaker. Um, what were your parents, what kind of background did your parents come from and how did they meet? All right, they they met actually in New Orleans. My father was in the army then, and my mother and friends had gone to New Orleans you know, for a trip. They came from more modest backgrounds. My mother 
Uh, my mother's father actually was uh, had trained to be an engineer, and he was going to install um, a new system at Tuskegee. But he died in the 1918 flu epidemic, which left my mother and her mother a widow and a little girl. So you know, her mother uh, taught school in Mississippi. Then when they moved to St. Louis, she worked as a dressmaker. Then she moved them to Chicago for more opportunities, and you know, worked her way up to be one of Chicago's early black police women, and then um, a precinct captain for the Democratic Party. And by the time I came along, she owned two buildings. So okay. <laughs> she had moved up. My father's father was um, a, what they called a master carpenter. He had his his um, crew, and they would they would they built houses in uh, in Mississippi. Uh, they had some trouble with the local whites. His mother had been a school teacher, but had also taken in laundry, you know, in this catch as cat can way. They clashed. They were considered a little arrogant with local whites, moved first to Denver, and then, because the school system was better, to California. And my grandmother declared that all of her sons were going to be doctors and lawyers, and that's what the three became. The sister the oldest uh, child, became a school teacher who, I think to compensate probably for this, clearly she wasn't encouraged to be a doctor or a lawyer, managed to acquire not one, not two, but three master's degrees. Okay. <laughs> one for each brother, right? Okay. <laughs> Do you think most people, either black or white or other, are aware of the tremendous efforts that many blacks made following slavery to get an education, to acquire a trade or profession, to acquire property and to live a respectable yeah. life. And to really be involved in politics, you know, um, in black politics. And uh, no, uh, it's not that there hasn't been scholarly work done on this. There has been, but it just doesn't enter the popular consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, it's as if we are of more use to the culture when we can be identified very flagrantly as other. Um, because if you're economically other and appear to be, you know, in terms of your manners, your language, other, then, you know, that allows for, it allows for more discrimination in certain ways, for acute discrimination, and it allows for a kind of exoticizing um, and, and belittling. Right. You write about growing up feeling that you had an obligation as a member of Negro society to be a role model for the masses of less educated Negroes, W.E.D. Boyce's talented, talented tent. tent. That yeah. is something that you really felt that you were taught? Or yeah. Were, yeah. I know. I don't think everyone in my world was, um, but my parents had a, had, had, a, had a definite sense of that. Now, you know, what is a role model? A role model isn't necessarily, this is, you know, the, the critic in me, isn't necessarily of that much practical use to people who need help. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> a role model represents, you know, values, ideals, maybe a certain kind of glamour, but isn't necessarily actively helping. Right. So, you know, I, I cannot honestly say that I was brought up Although uh, some people I know were to, you know, you must make a very concrete, you know, social contribution. But I was, you must excel, you must succeed, um, you know, on honorable terms right. in, a, in a profession and a life. And if you don't, that in some way is a disappointment to the, 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 prog the progress mm -hmm. of the race. And it very much um, thwarts all that we as your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents have worked to achieve. Right. On the other hand, did you ever feel that as a member of the black elite, you were like the black bourgeoisie described by E. Franklin Frazier, that you belonged to a group that was shallow, pretentious, and disdainful of the black mass? Yes, you ever feel that? this too. <laughs> this too is true, Cheryl. <laughs> Not a question. Yeah. You write about some of the obsessions of the black upper middle class, of the importance of physical appearance, in particular of having straighter hair, longer hair, lighter skin, <laughs> more Caucasian features. Do you think the black, um, I'm, I'm going to call them the black upper middle class because that's how I think of them. Absolutely. Do you think that they are, as a group, more obsessed with physical appearances than the black masses? Today or then? Hard to say. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I'm in the when I think back, 
you know, if you pour through old magazines uh, from Tan to Ebony, which had its, you know, striving um, aims to Jet, which was a little funkier, you know, all of them are, are just permeated with hair ads, skin ads. You know, I actually started doing a fair, you know, a fair amount of research. Uh, but I think the color coding was more obsessive. The skin color coding was more obsessive in the black haute bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And um, the, the, the reverence, the kind of rapture that could surround, you know, the straight hair and the look, possibly because um, more people in that group, for clear historical reasons, had access to those looks, possessed right. those right. looks in some way. So, oh, there they were, you know. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> and it, it became a very almost allegorical symbol of you white people think we are so different. Look at us. Right. We could be you. Right. Not just because of our education and our manners and our voices, but because of how we look. And I remember um, when I was in Atlanta visiting the Herndon House, um, th there were... Um, I think it was Alonzo Hearn, and I may be getting his name wrong. He was a very, very fair-skinned black man who, he started out as a barber, wound up owning uh, a life insurance company. Okay. And if you look at the pictures uh, of these, this black family, they're all white. They're all <laughs> quite, white. Quite and literally they all, so. they all married other white Negroes. And I, I often wonder what it must be like to be categorized as a Negro when you are physically it, white, indistinguishable. It must be so mysterious. Strange. Yes. Well, you know, the writer Charles Chestnut, who looked entirely physically white, was, I believe, actually only one-eighth. Really? Negro or okay. colored. Right. And, you know, said he had made a conscious decision. But, of course, many of his books, you know, um, are about this crossing of the line and this, right. this strange... Unreal consciousness. Yeah. And there's also James Walden Johnson's autobiography of an ex-colored. Mm -hmm. It's so peculiar. Yeah, you know, your book took me back to a lot of things. <laughs> um, I remember when you were t talking about growing up, um, the nice clothes, the woolen coach with the Persian lamb collars, mm -hmm. the taffeta and velvet dresses, the crinolines, the, oh, the muffs, yes. the ankle straps. Girl gear. Girl <laughs> gear of the 50s and 60s. Yes, yes. You remember your parents' parties, the jewelry, the women have their cigarettes uh, uh, lit, going out on your parents' boat on Lake Michigan. Do you look back on those things with uh, a certain nostalgia? Uh, yes. Actually, I happened to love the clothes. I, I, I loved that girl gear. Um, yes, they gave us in many, many ways a, a, an extremely pleasing life. You know, with all these pleasures and accoutrements. And it, yeah. Right. Um, and I'm, part of the nostalgia is a kind of gratitude because I, now I know how much went into it, mm -hmm. you know, went into sustaining that. Right. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Margot Jefferson, whose latest book, Negro Land, a memoir, is one you will find eye-opening. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Pulitzer Prize winning critic Margot Jefferson. Her latest book, Negro Land, a memoir, has just been published by Pantheon Books. You and your sister um, went to the University of Chicago Lab School, one of two private schools in the city that admitted Negroes. There were very, very few blacks at that school, correct? Um, yes, I believe. You know, unfortunately, I, I don't ever remember, you know, numbers exactly from once I've written them down. I believe the first student was admitted shortly after, um, you know, in the, in the post-war years because the school began to examine itself okay. in the wake of World War II. But I think that would have been 47, 48. Okay. Um, when I got there, you know, we, we, were, a, we were a small and full. In my kindergarten class, I think there were maybe three of us. And you were always, you know, from the times you started school, one of a very small number, of a small number of blacks in your school. Yes. And that seemed to be a, a happy experience for you. It's not always. 
Uh, you know, the in the book, I, I talk about this this doubleness of comfort and ease and, and, and happiness. It was a lovely school in many ways. It was genuinely progressive. You know, we did fun things <laughs> as we went along. Uh, and yet, I also do write a lot about those, you know, pricks of of consciousness, of of difference, you know, of of something, you know, some moment, some tone of voice that's off pitch. Or I describe strange. it as you know, you're driving down, uh, down a highway, sixty miles per hour, going uh, six miles per hour, and all of a sudden you hit a, a speed bump. Exactly. <laughs> right. And when you're very young, you don't quite understand what it means. Um, some of it is also overhearing, you know, your parents talk about, well, which parents are polite, really polite to them, which ones are not. Right. How was that parents' night? They went to um, the school picnic. You know, is anyone talking to them? That kind of thing. And there were always some who did very graciously, but there were always some who didn't. Right. Right. Or I would come home asking some coded question. It was never, you know, coarse you know, I did have a teacher who, one teacher one year who had us singing Stephen Foster songs, and she had very consciously changed the word darky to lordy. The next year, my school, the school teacher who taught us those songs reinstated darky. So I came home singing, oh, darkies, how my heart grows weary. And my mother, <laughs> and she couldn't decide what to do. I remember her saying, ah, oh, you know, Mrs. Schof was so, Miss Schof was so sensitive. You know, Mrs. Pollock is so insensitive. Did she protest? Did she decide not to? I don't know. You know, these were not huge. I was not going to be chased, right. you know, like my father had by little schoolboys right. with right. stones. But it was... Things that prick at you. Yeah, yeah. One and way, you have to have that double consciousness. Yeah. Yes. And one way your parents kept you in touch with your Negroness, you know, as you and your sister were going to predominantly white schools, was to, um, well, they made an effort to instill a knowledge of black culture in you. They did, particularly once they realized that we were, uh, once it became very clear with some lapses on my sisters and my part that we were not, obviously not getting this, you Mm -hmm. know, and they realized, oh, wait a minute, we have to be active. This can't just be taken for granted. Also, you know, they, they had clubs they put us in, you know, they organized. There was Jack and Jill. There were all sorts of other little clubs friends belonged to. They organized a very active Negro social life for us so that we would not be dependent on white friends and so that we would have a sense that, you know, we had our own um, coherent society and world and accomplishments and pleasures. One thing that really struck me was learning about all of your relatives and all of the people in your parents' circle who spent at least a portion of their lives passing for white. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, um, it's something I, I learned about first when I was in about fifth grade, and an uncle, a great uncle of mine, came back into the world of Negroland. He had retired from his job, so he no longer had to pass. So he moved back, and it had to be explained to Denise and and me that you know Uncle Lucius had been living as a white man. So you know, as you just said about these pictures, he came to dinner. I had grown up with with a number of Negroes who looked white, but Uncle Lucius looked white and had lived as a white man, and it was so startling. Then, as I got older my parents began to confide more of these stories. And, you know, it was everywhere, you know. Pat had a twin who'd been passing. You know, this Pat M. had a twin who'd been passing. You know, Nuffy C. said to my mother, you know Irma, and she didn't say it bitterly. I said, you know Irma, I'm the only one of six, seven, eight children, you know, to be living full-time. As, <laughs> as a, a Negro. Negro. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I found that amazing. It's, um, it is probably even truer, though, in the South, I would think but maybe not. I don't know. I don't know either. All right. I take that back. For blacks who have grown up living cordially with white people, as, 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 as you did, the high school years are often the years when those relationships start to become strained. Did that happen in your case? In certain ways, yes. Um, close friendships remained, but um, our, our school, um, Every group in, in that school, you know, the, the blacks here, the, the wasps, um, 
ethnic, uh, maybe Catholic, otherwise ethnic, um, Jews. Everyone had parents who were in some way worried about these different ethnic, religious, Interacting as teenagers. Exactly, exactly. And we got, as blacks, you know, I think the charge was highest there. And we got, um, we got spoken to very carefully. Don't let yourself be humiliated you know, by, these, by presum presuming that you're going to be invited to this, that. Sometimes one was. Um, our parents were not eager for us to date. You know, across the racial lines. The, the line in those days was often, well, he or she, you know, depending on whether you're a boy or a girl, might seem loving and fond, but what word will slip out of his, her mouth? And know, I think one thing when, that, when he, she is angry at you. And I think that one thing that uh, people don't realize is that middle and upper middle class uh, parents are not eager for their children to date across racial lines. They're really not. They're really they not. very much, and they're not eager for their children to date across racial lines or across class lines. They really wanted to perpetuate this group, uh, which is very typically American in terms, right. uh, very typically whatever, class. That's a very typical attitude of any class. Right. We preserve and protect ourselves. Right. So you went on to Brandeis, and, uh, and, and it's the middle of the, you know, the civil rights movement. Is, is yes, I hit off. there in 64. I graduate in 68. Yeah. Okay. And what impact did the civil rights movement have on a Negro girl at a white university? Well, Brandeis in those days was actually quite progressive. So what I walked into was you know, again, a fairly small community of blacks, though it got bigger every year, but um, civil rights demonstrations, anti-war demonstrations, you know, we were doing all of that. But what I also walked into was a, a coherent and consistent effort on the part of blacks at different schools all around Boston to make sure that we socialized together. You know, right. we had our own, our own group in a, and you finish in what year? 68. Okay. So the, 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 the next year. 69. I was up in Massachusetts. And everybody had African-American society. We had oh, Soul absolutely. Weekend. Which, yes, which, which usually started around 66, right? Right, That's when exactly. Black Power really hit. You had Soul Weekends. You had your Black, your black student, Black Power right. organization. You would do things like, um, I remember a friend and I walked into a speech that Edward Brooke who was then running for senator. Right. He was the first black candidate for senator. And we had decided as black power people that you know, he was a tool of the establishment. So Carol and I sat in the back of the big auditorium. And as he came up to the podium to speak, we stood up, said, black power, and, and turned on our heels and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> You made your statement. We made, Cheryl, <laughs> we made our statement. Um, you made your statement. But it, it, was, it was exciting. Other things were also going on. The women's movement had not started yet, but you know, anything surprising could happen any day. I can still remember the, the tale of the first girl on my dorm floor to get, on my dorm floor to get birth control pills. Mm -hmm. You know, so everything was moving at a tremendous right. pace. We have only three minutes left, and I'm almost... Guilty, feel guilty about asking this question. This is a big question because you, you write that while you would achieve success as a journalist, um, you would treat it like a concession you've been forced to make, that, that you came to feel that too much had been required of you, so you took revenge by insisting on an inner life regulated by despair. I, what I think, and I know we don't have a lot of time, is one one real reaction um, that you can have to you know, all of this channeling of, um, you know, political and historical weights and the burdens and the, and the ugliness and that, that you're always supposed to behave perfectly. You know, you will never give way. You are, you are, you are too, too strong. Um, there are various ways to rebel against that, you know, and to just say, no, I'm tired of it. Um, and one way, my way, was, you know, because I still needed to behave well and achieve. My, my way was to choose a kind of um, 
angry depression mm -hmm. as 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 a as almost as, a, as an escape you know? that I'm entitled not to be perfect exactly and I'm in, and I'm entitled not to say I have risen above all this mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. exactly in our one minute left yes. what do you hope readers are going to take from your book what do you hope they take from your book that sense of of, of a these very individual particular lives that we have and we we're independent we're individual but they are permeated by you know our cultural and historical lineage and you know to be aware of that at all times and, and those negotiations i hope they will okay they will get that well i think a lot of people are going to find your book revelatory uh, I found it took me back to a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> you, so, memory yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Not revelatory, but memory suffused. Right, exactly. All right, all right. We're out of time. I want to thank Margaret Jefferson for joining me today. Negro Land, a memoir, has just been published by Pantheon Books for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.